Inshallah, our next speaker will be Brother Rais Guyan. Brother Rais Guyan has a remarkable story that people and mainstream news media all over the world had interviewed him about his campaign called World Without Hate. It took root in Bangladesh and grew from seeds planted by his parents and strong Islamic beliefs in forgiveness. Following a life-altering incident of being shot in the face by a white supremacist after the events of 9-11, Brother Rais has been named one of the one of Esquire's Americans of the Year in 2011. Without much ado, I'll call up to stage Brother Rais Guyan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Brother Sunil, for your beautiful introduction. Before I start my speech, let's take a look at the video for five minutes as an introduction. And uh, then I will speak a few words. As he could. On three separate nights, he walked into Dallas gas stations with a shotgun, opening fire killing two Muslim men and shooting another man in the face. The third victim, Rais Boyan, just barely survived the shooting. Boyan will be partially blind for the rest of his life because of his injuries. He wasn't interested in eye-for-an-eye eye justice. Why? Because his Muslim religion preaches forgiveness. All the way up until the day that Stroman was executed, Boyan petitioned the state of Texas to spare Stroman's life launching a global petition to have a sentence commuted to life without parole. I heard your marks to many years ago. In fact, I never hit him. I never hit him very before what happened to me. I believe he was ignorant and not capable of distinguishing between right and wrong. Otherwise, he would have done what he did. In my favor, forgiveness is the best policy and Islam doesn't allow for hate and killing. And Stroman took notice. He was struck by the compassion that was afforded to him by one of his victims. And he changed his way. In a message to Raiz Boyan from jail, Stroman said, In the free world, I was free. But I was locked in a prison inside myself because of the hate I carried in my heart. It is due to Raiz's message of forgiveness that I am more content now than I've ever been. And last night, Stroman built on the message and used his last breath to issue these last words for us all to hear. Hate is going on in this world, and it has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. As a result of what a group of hateful men, and not what a religion, did on 9-11, our nation, just like Stroman admitted to, is often consumed with hate. We have a man running for president who's disqualified Muslims from serving in his administration, and I argue that our nation has the right to deny Muslims a place of worship. Would you be comfortable appointing a Muslim either in your cabinet or as a uh, federal judge? No. I will not. So you're saying any community, if they want to ban a mosque? Yes, they have the right to do that. We have a prominent member of Congress who's using his powers as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee to whip up fear in our nation and investigate American Muslims for radicalism. I believe mean, it's important to have this investigation on radicalization of the Muslim community. We've seen what happened in England. We know that Al-Qaeda is trying to recruit people over here, such as they did with the subway bombing in New York last year, the attempted subway bombing, Times Square bombing. These are all people living legally in the United States. We have the most popular cable news network saying that all terrorists are Muslims and warning, warning Americans about victory mosques in New York City and Tennessee and hate-fueled caliphates springing up to bring Sharia law to America. Not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. If you are an 18 to 28 year old Muslim man, then you should be strip searched. And if we don't do that, there's a very high probability we're gonna lose an airline. Building that Victory Mosque on what's in essence a burial site would be both disruptive and cold-hearted to the families of 9-11 survivors. 
and victims. Most dangerous scenario is that radical Muslims seize power and put Sharia law into place. Same thing. These are all components of a hate machine, filling us all with fear and driving some of us, like Stroman, to lash out in violence. But Islam is not the real threat to America. Our own hatred, our own fear, is the biggest threat to this nation. As the Southern Poverty Law Center points out, there are more than a thousand hate groups operating across America today. Their numbers have grown by 54% since 9-11. They are neo-Nazis, Klansmen, white supremacists, black separatists, and border vigilantes. They're all over. They're all over the country. The, the, the various militia, it's, it's, it's filling America. What they are not, however, are Muslims. In fact, according to FBI data, 94% of all the terrorist acts committed on U.S. soil over the past decade were not from radical Muslims, but instead from these very same hate groups that are popping up across America. And while our news media will feast once every few years on Muslim attack that is thwarted, they ignore the hate crimes that are carried out every single day in America, often leaving families devastated and communities in distress. As Mark Stroman said just before the lethal cocktail was pumped into his arm, hate causes a lifetime of pain. So let's not let this story of forgiveness and frankly of enlightenment be forgotten. Let's end this hateful so-called war on terror and focus on ridding this nation of the far more destructive force, hate and fear. Well, thank you all. Uh, I have a dream of a world without hate. Is it possible? I believe it is. It's possible. We just have to combine our sincere desire, along with our persistence, to take us to that level where we, the atheists, the Buddhists, the Christians, Hindus, Jews and Muslims, will not hate each other because of their race, religion, skin color, sexual orientation, or nationality. Thank you, IAT, for arranging such a beautiful program and giving me a chance to speak a few words in this event today. I also like to thank Muslim Legal Fund of America, Brother Khalil Mead, for their great support during my campaign last year to save the life of Mark Stroman. I also like to thank IAT again because of their support back in 2003 when I was struggling to survive in this country. I also like to thank Brother Wasim Nasrullah, the ex-president of MLFA, who also provided a lot of support in 2003. I also like to thank Brother Mohsin Mandavia for his support all the time when I needed to bring some TV camera or some media person, some writers. He always said yes, go ahead. Even within half an hour advance notice, he was there. I also like to thank Brother Muhammad Hassan and Muhammad Kamal because of the great support. Based on their support, I, I could build a career on IT and I'm, a, I'm a working today as IT manager at a global company in Dallas. Besides these people, there are many other folks and organizations I also like to thank them from the bottom of my heart. Ten days after 9-11, my peaceful heart was about to be stopped when a white supremacist named Mark Stroman stormed in the gas station where I was working and shot me from four to five feet away with a double barrel shotgun in my face. With the mercy of God, luckily I survived, but there are two other persons innocent person who lost their lives. Mark Stribble was in the middle of a shooting rampage after 9-11 to express his anger towards those of Middle Eastern descent. And in his mind, brown-skinned people are from Middle East and they're Muslims. 
So he ended up killing a person from Pakistan named Wakar Hassan, another person named Vasudev Patel from India, and he also shot me, but lucky they survived. He did all this crime. When he was doing all this crime, he was under influence of illegal drugs. He was less educated, and I believe that he was ignorant, and he could not differentiate between right and wrong. That was Mark Strowman. But what we saw in the video, the educated people, they are the ones spreading fear and ignorance and hate and doing their best to divide people in the USA. This is very unfortunate. But I believe that if those people, if they would know Islam better, the real teachings of Islam, they would be singing a different song in the media and they would do their best to keep the nation united to face the challenge we are going through at this moment. But in reality, they are not. It's also our duty to make sure we spread the real message of Islam to all those hate homers. Islam, uh, I completely agree with uh, Tom Hartman. You can find that video in my website, world.hate.org. The video is there. I completely agree with Tom Hartman, he's a news anchor from Russian TV, that Islam is not a threat to USA. Our own fear, our ignorance is our enemy. And that is true. Islam is not a threat to USA. Islam is a gift to USA. Islam is a religion of peace and forgiveness. In Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him many times as al Ghafur, as many as 70 times, the most forgiving. He also mentioned him as uh, Al-Tawab 11 times, the acceptor of repentance. Allah also mentioned him as uh, Al-Halim, as the uh, Clement, 15 times, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim. These are the names Allah used mostly in Quran. Al-Rahman, 57 times, and Al-Rahim, at least 115 times. So Islam is not a religion of violence, it's a religion of peace and forgiveness. In many places, Allah also mentioned him with many others names, which refers Allah is full of love, forgiveness, and mercy. And Allah also sent his last messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mercy to the entire universe. He is referred as Ramadan lil Alameen. And we are his ummah. We have a lot of work to do to spread the real message of Islam in this country. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was a man of forgiving and also full of peace and mercy. If we take a look at his life, he set hundreds of thousands of examples of peace and mercy. For example, we all know the incidents of Taif. Because if I want to go and describe it, I think it will take a lot of time, but I would like to Keep my speech short. I went to Taif during my Hajj in 2009. It was a promise to Allah that if I get my life back, I will take my mother to Hajj. And my mom wanted to go to Taif. We went there. It's a city of peace. Because of Prophet Muhammad's act 1400 years back, this city is referred to the city of forgiveness, peace. But if you would have acted in a different way, we would have remembered the city in a different way, not the city of mercy or forgiveness. We also see the examples of victory of Mecca. When Prophet Muhammad returned to Mecca with the victory, he forgave all his enemies. He didn't take any revenge. Also during the time, uh, during the time of uh, uh, when he forgave all the people in Mecca, the woman named him who caused the killing of his uncle, Amir Hamza, radiallahu anhu. And not only that, she also humiliated his body and also chewed his liver. We all know that. But it's still, after she accepted Islam, our Prophet forgave him. Like this, there, there are several examples I can name. It will take a lot of time. I was taught by my parents all these examples when I was a little kid. And those examples touched me very, very deeply. So when I, had, I was in that kind of situation, I had to stay humble in front of Allah. I have to follow my prophet's path. I think I did the right thing. Though Mark Stroman tried to kill me, but once I got my life back, I forgave him, 
And in course of time, I went through psychological, mental, psychological improvement. And at some point when I came back from Hodge, I realized that forgiving Mark Sturman is not enough. He did something very terrible. How I can do something to turn this negative experience into a positive one? I talked with the other victims' families, and once they found out, they also forgave Mark Sturman. I talked to Imam uh, Yusuf Kabachi. I came to the mosque, I also talked to many other scholars, and they all said, go for it. If you can do something, that's what Islam talk about, peace, forgiveness, and mercy. I started my campaign in public at the beginning of, uh, at the end of 2010. And within a short time, I got a tremendous amount of support, not only from Dallas, Texas, from all over the world, starting from Brazil to Norway, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan to Australia. I put a website and people signed up from all over the world. And I went to public to run a campaign to save the attacker's life who killed two innocent people and also tried to kill me. Because what I believe that, that his execution will not eradicate hate crimes from this world, we will simply lose a human life with the dealing with the root cause, which is hate. But if we save his life, who knows, he might become a spokesperson and raising awareness of hate crimes. And that is the right thing to do. So with this intention, I started my campaign, and thanks to Reprieve, it's a London-based non-profit organization. They helped me to take my campaign to international. I went to the European Union Parliament. I spoke at the German Parliament. I went to Denmark, had a meeting with the executives of Lundek, the lethal injection manufacturer, and I convinced them to write a letter to the Texas governor not to use their product to kill a human being, and they did. Recently, Lundbeck also announced they will stop supplying the pentobarbital. It's one of the injections used to kill human beings. They will not supply that lethal injection to the United States states which carry out execution. It was a great success. Not only that, I also took my case to all the way U.S. Supreme Court, Federal Court, Fifth Circuit, also Texas Civil Court, because I realized that he is a human being who committed a terrible crime, but he deserves a second chance. And his execution is not the solution. With all these efforts, I was failed. Though I don't think it's my failure, Mark Stroman was executed July 20th, 2011. But before that, Mark Stroman was a changed person. He wrote a personal letter to me a month before he was executed. And he also gave several interviews to the news media's newspaper, where he said, good thing about Islamic community, about Muslims, about world peace, about human rights. And he was a changed person. Well, before he was executed, I had a chance to talk to him for a few seconds though I requested the Texas Board of Parole and Parole and Department of Criminal Justice to allow me to have a face-to-face -face meeting with him. But for some reason, they never allowed me. But I had a chance to talk to him for a few seconds. And in our phone conversation, he told me that I'm his brother. He said, Grace, I love you, bro. And I couldn't hold my tears. Ten years back, it's the same man who tried to kill me because of my Islamic faith. After 10 years, once he found that I'm running a campaign in public, nationally and internationally, to save his life, and now he's calling me a brother, and he says he loves me. So what made him change? Is it the prison system? Is the punishment, the death penalty, being behind bar for nine years? No. The thing changed him was peace, forgiveness, compassion, and love. And that is Islam talk about. That is the real Islam. And that made him change, not the punishment system. It's very unfortunate that we couldn't save him. Think in this way, how powerful that would be if Mark Sherman is still alive and he can join this conference through a Skype video and he could speak, he could answer your questions. How powerful that would be. But the vision I had 
The people in power didn't have the same vision. So they went ahead and killed him. Even the last moment when Mark Stone was being executed, I was in the courtroom up to 8 p.m. and I was trying my best to stop the execution to save the human life. His execution was supposed to be at 6 p.m. but because of my appeal in the court, the trial went ahead up to 8 p.m. but finally he was being executed around 8.30 p.m. on July 20th. But the story is not, it's not there and it's not ending there. I need to stop my campaign. I'm still running my campaign. I'm talking locally, nationally, and also internationally to end the cycle of hate and violence by inspiring people so that people can accept each other as a human first, despite all the differences. Because the first thing is we all are human beings. It doesn't matter if you are Muslim, you are Christian, you are Jews, you are Buddhist, we all are human beings. And we, have all the, we, have all, we all have equal right to equally exist in this world. I'm in touch with Mark Stone's family. I, stayed, I talked to his, his, uh, his daughters. His son is behind bar. It seems like the cycle of violence is going on from father to the son and then to family. So we need to work together to end the cycle of the violence. Otherwise, his son is following the daddy's plan and they are part of our society. It doesn't matter if they're Christians, but they're still human beings and we have to work with each other for our peaceful existence. I'm running the campaign still. And I also build a non-profit organization to inspire people to end the cycle of hate and violence and also overcome the fear and the ignorance we saw in the video that is going on in this country. Well, uh, we Muslims will also have our duty because the Islamophobia is going on in this country. We also have our duties towards removing those fears. And there are three things I will talk at the end of my speech. But before that, I would like to share one more story. This is a true story. And that's what I learned from Islamic teachings from my parents as well. That when I moved to an apartment complex two years back, I went ahead and introduced myself with my neighbors. And as a Bangladeshi cultural thing, I made some rice pudding. And I went up on my neighbor's door. The first neighbor opened that door was Indian couple. And they were surprised seeing a single guy coming to the door with some traits to introduce themselves, who introduced himself. I was welcomed. It was a very good conversation. The next door I went, they didn't open the door. I could see there are people inside. Their kids are crying inside the house, but nobody's opening the door. And I thought I did my part. They did theirs. But I didn't give up. I thought that next time I'll see them, I'll say hello in the parking lot, maybe in the staircase or somewhere. So next time I saw that guy on a parking lot, I said hello to him. But that time there was no rice pudding, it was empty hand. So in course of time, I got more chances to talk to him and introduce myself and get to know each other more. And I gave my phone number and I said, I live upstairs. If there's anything you need from myself, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm there. And he can also come upstairs. We can play we, but there is no leave uh, alcohol or cigarette because I don't do that. You have to bring your own water if you want to, but things will be there. At one Saturday, I was running in my apartment complex and I got a phone call and I carry myself on all the time because I'm always on call at my work. And then I found out he, my neighbor is calling me and he said, Race, I had a car wreck yesterday and uh, I feel I'm gonna pass away you any moment. Can you come and please take me to the hospital? My wife is pregnant and she cannot be held at this moment. I quickly turned around, went back, took him to the hospital. And after we were in the hospital, he was asking for a doctor paper. And that way he was reacting. It seems like he is, he's gonna pass away any moment. And I thought that is his last wish to have a doctor paper. But unfortunately, I didn't bring my credit card with me. I didn't take any cash with me. And I said, okay, give me a minute. I'm gonna go downstairs and get a doctor paper for you. Then I called my buddy. That either you bring a doctor paper or bring a dollar bill for me. And he was shocked that you never ask for a dollar bill or a doctor bill what is happening. I said, just come quickly, there's a situation. So it took several minutes, and then when I went upstairs buying a doctor paper, my neighbor was telling me what it took so long. And so I will tell you later on, just have your doctor paper. After several hours of treatment, doctor let him go. And on the way, we stopped by at uh, Chamedi restaurant. 
and uh, I treated him with a pegoli dinner. He was very happy, took something to go for his wife as well. Next day he called me again. He said, Race, I need to come upstairs and make something clear straight with you. And I thought maybe you want to talk about Dr. Peporti or something I didn't do right yesterday. That's why he wants to make it straight. I was nervous. Then he came upstairs and he said, what you did yesterday, it really opened my eyes. And by the way, he's from Nashville, Tennessee. He said, what you did, it really opened my eyes. All this time I was ignoring you. I was treating you not good because I thought you are from Middle East and I was treating you as those, one of those suicide bombers. And that's why I was ignoring you all the time. But what you did to me yesterday, that opened my eyes. And from today onward, you are my brother. If there's anything I can do, you always call me first, you call downstairs. You shouldn't go to anyone to come to me first. So what changed him? I didn't do anything extra. I just did what I was taught to do as a Muslim. Good to be, good to be my neighbors and the right thing. Then when I was running my campaign, to save Mark Stroman's life. He called me one day and he said, is that you running the campaign to save your attacker's life? I said, yes. And he said that I'm a good Christian and I'm still pro death penalty. And this guy tried to end your life and you're running to save his life? Are you crazy? I said, no, I'm not crazy. I know what I'm doing. And then he said, how do we become friends? We have separate thoughts with different thoughts and ideas. And my answer was, though we have differences, but still we respect each other's thoughts and ideas. And that's why we became friends in the first place. And he said, no wonder I'm watching TV and you are running a campaign to save your attacker's life. So now we, we see that, you know, the, once you practice true message of Islam, once you really practice what you're supposed to do in a regular life, the fear, the ignorance will go away automatically. But we have to combine our, the way I said at the beginning, that our sincere desire and our actions together. Unless we do that, it should be very tough to work on this fear and the ignorance going on in this country about Islam. So here's one thing I'd like to ask everyone, that we are here today. This is our country. We are not going back. That way Mark Schumann tried to kill me and he thought I would go back or do something. It doesn't matter how much people hate me, I'm still here. And this is my country. And I'm a proud American citizen. This is my country. So let's treat ourselves. We are the citizens of this country. Let's do the right thing. Let's learn the culture. Let's define ourselves. And let's not to be not be defined by them. Because if we if we don't do enough, if we do the right thing, people will be defining us in the wrong way. So as a Muslim, let's get to know our neighbors from today onward. Please, this, is, this is very important. Because Islam talks about peace and forgiveness, love and mercy. They need to understand that. So let's get to know our neighbors, tell them who we are. And not only tell them, let's also practice what we tell them. Otherwise there will be a discrepancy, there will be a double standard. We say something, we do something different. So let's get to know our neighbors, let's get to know our co-workers, and let's also get to know our classmates. And that will overcome a lot of this fear and hate and ignorance. Thank you very, very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.